Hello and welcome to Using Collaboration and Technology to Overcome Growing Inequity in Digital and Blended Learning. A quick note to the audience, I will describe each slide for viewers with disabilities. The first slide shows the Online Learning Consortium logo against a blue background. The current slide shows the Continual Engine logo and the title of the presentation against a red background. My name is Rajiv Narayana, and I am president of digital learning design and development company Ansosource, as well as chief learning officer of learning automation firm Continual Engine. I have the privilege today of being joined by Scott DeSano, Director of Content Production and Digital Studio at the world's largest academic publisher, Pearson. My team and I have worked closely with Scott to introduce discontinuous innovation in some of Pearson's workflows, but more importantly, Scott helped us understand how to integrate our innovations in a way that better enabled their success across what is a large and complicated education company. The next slide shows the answer source and continual engine logos above several learners with computers and mobile devices. Today's discussion is short, so I'll get right to the point. After 20 years of designing and developing content for millions of learners, my company faced a major inflection point. Digital technology enabled scale like no other innovation in education, but it also held the potential to exacerbate ex existing inequities. Scott will set the broader context in just a moment, but from our perspective, one of the greatest challenges we saw was the need for learning experiences that were accessible for everyone. In our learning design work, we observed the need to convert hundreds of thousands of images and other content to more accessible formats, but rarely was there the time or budget to be able to give the content the attention it deserved. To overcome this hurdle, we took 20 years of learning content experience and invested two years in research and development, and what emerged was a collaboratively intelligent tool, allowing us to use artificial intelligence to understand complicated images and automatically describe them for learners with visual or cognitive disabilities. The current pace of technological advancement has been predicted to leave many people behind and exacerbate the uh, inequities in society. However, many experts have also said this next industrial revolution also holds the potential promise of helping human beings thrive in ways that were previously not dreamed of. We hope that Continual Engine and Pearson's shared story helps provide some insights into how technology can be used to tilt the balance in the favor of human thriving. The next slide shows a quote. World Economic Forum founder and executive chairman Klaus Schwab in his book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, captured the moment best when he said, the changes are so profound that from the perspective of human history, there has never been a time of greater promise or potential peril. My concern, however, is that decision makers are too often caught in traditional linear and non-disruptive thinking or too absorbed by immediate concerns to think strategically about the forces of disruption and innovation shaping our future. When innovation and best practices in digital learning scale and scale affordably, they allow us the room to create more equitable and robust learning experiences. That is the intent of this talk, to give some insights from our work together to help the broader community adopt some simple but powerful approaches to collaboration and technology adoption. With that, I hand it over to Scott. Scott? Thanks, Rajiv. So before we get into the more conversational aspect between me and Rajiv, I think I want to set some context. Um, number one, contextually, I'm speaking for myself. I'm speaking based on my career path, and I want I think if you understand where I, where I came from, you'll understand where we're going. So first, I've been in higher education since 1986. Um, this was right on the cusp of the digital age. And by the digital age, I mean desktop computers, personal computers, uh, desktop applications like Quark and InDesign, and the emergence of the internet as a distribu distribution and communication tool. Um, Pre-internet work was really incredibly siloed. We worked on print textbooks and they were static and they were done. And we didn't have a lot of real communication with our customers, almost none. Um, our customers were academics and students and we made books and they went away. Um, as the internet kind of evolved, we began to get user feedback and the user feedback was about the stability of our content in the digital realm and issues of accessibility and issues of representation that we had never heard about. So it's really important to kind of keep that in mind. And as we evolved and we went more and more into the digital space, we began to realize that our content was kind of unstable um, because our content was given to end users and end users computers and systems may well behave differently than the product we made. So for example, if an end user has, doesn't have the exact same font family that the publisher made things in, or you made things in, they wouldn't work. 
Um, in the world I live in right now, math content is unstable on certain devices and certain browsers. So one of the things we've learned over the last few years is two real key things I think I want people to take away from this discussion. Number one, digital content needs to be simple. Digital content needs to be built with the end user in mind with standard settings, standard templates um, that are accessible. The secondary thing I think I want people to walk away from is that as much as we try to solve problems internally, we also need to solve problems with vendor relationships in mind because vendors know things we don't know and will scale appropriately. Because as we know, part of the struggle of doing this kind of work and hitting this kind of digital st stable mark is that it costs a lot of money, right? So keep it simple, keep it standardized, and rely on vendor relationships. Um, and they will help us go to the next level. So with that in mind, I think we should go into the larger conversation about Rajiv and what we did together uh, with Invicta. And then we can fill in some gaps in the conversation. Thank you, Scott. Um, very insightful. Uh, the case study Scott is speaking of is the collaboration between Pearson and Continual Engine. And I'll start with you know, some very high level results. Uh, we were able to produce a large volume of accessible content, save money, deliver faster, reduce rework because of high and consistent quality. And in the process, we improved our tool's ability to learn how to do this in new subject areas. Uh, the technology works by reading an image, understanding its components and the relationship to each other. And it produces code containing this information and then translates the code to a description according to the pre preferences and guidelines of our clients. That's the technology in a nutshell. And the visual on your screen shows the Invicta platform in action, showing an engineering diagram being processed by the platform and the user manually editing the output. Now that's the technology, but as we talked about earlier, the technology uh, part of the problem was, was less than half of the problem. It was actually quite a bit about the uh, behavior change that we needed to influence in order to get the tool to be in use at Pearson. And so while we had you know, uh, accomplished a pretty amazing feat in being able to uh, change uh, how accessibility was treated, what we didn't anticipate was the amount of collaboration it would take to be able to drive the change required for people to adopt this process and actually begin to uh, change how accessibility is done at a major publisher. And we had the benefit of working with Scott who saw the possibilities of this tool and saw the opportunity to influence the workflow. I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, one of the most important aspects of, uh, of the adoption of this tool or any tool that can really drive meaningful change in equity and education, uh, you know, a big piece of it is collaboration. So I wanted to get your thoughts about that aspect of, of the relationship and the relationship with the broader ecosystem of, of providers and partners in, uh, you know, in education and with Pearson. So I kept my initial statements kind of small because I wanted to make sure we had a lot of time to talk. So that's a really important question because the thing I had said about vendors and vendor relationships and relying on vendors, Pearson works with a body of established primary vendors. And the solution and problem we had on our hand is thousands and thousands of images that were actually delaying the release of our digital content. Um, we had our two primary vendors involved in doing that work and we brought in, in Continual Engine and the team to discuss change, to discuss a better process. So we spent months and months and months working with the four companies collaborating at an incredibly deep level um, that from my standpoint in my career was extremely rare. And this sort of change and this kind of innovation is extremely disruptive to existing patterns. And only by really talking through it, can you get through it? And I think the driving factor in that kind of change is the wanting to change and the will to change and the ability to communicate in a really deep and serious manner. It's fairly unprecedented in my way, in my kind of career. Um, so kudos to everybody. Rajiv is kind of underselling what we accomplished a little bit. 
um, because it's a radical shift and extremely disruptive and was based fundamentally in vendor relationships and human relationships. Does that answer your question? It does. It does. And, uh, you know, it begs another. Um, You know, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about this kind of disruption, disruption is everywhere. And all of us are having to transform how we live, how we work because of technological and societal upheaval. So I I know that when we look back at, you know, the legacy of a lot of uh, organizations, we were very siloed in how we approached things. Uh, but in, in the modern environment, uh, you can't be that way anymore. More. I wanted to ask you about how that has affected Pearson and how you think you know, that the way of working has to evolve in order to stay agile. Um, it comes down to market demand, actually. Um, and time to market, complexity, especially the rapid nature of change now, um, basically comes down to foreshadowing things to come as best you can and trying to build processes that kind of see what's coming ahead um, to the extent you can do that. Um, The only way to do that is to be really thoughtful about what you're doing, keep it simple, um, and keep lines of communication really open. And I, te- I very much believe that um, like a community of technicians and a community of thought leaders in some respects need to keep pushing onto the new territory and asking each other, what do you hear what's going on out there? Because, you know, you talked really quickly about silos and I referenced my career earlier and it was extremely siloed. We were extremely just talking to ourselves. Um, I think the earmark of change is broadening the conversation. Again, did that that, answer your question? (laughs) Yes, yes, it does. Uh, And of course, it begs another. Um, The... uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, one of the things that you're pointing out is, is you know, the willingness to change and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, also having broader conversations across a wider spectrum of stakeholders. So I wanted to, to ask you to expand a little bit on, you know, what it took to get all the stakeholders in the same room and on the same page so that we could move forward with this, with this innovation. Uh, it took a lot of uncomfortable conversations. It took... <laughs> someone saying we have to do this uh and it's more about the will to do it and getting people in a room and talking in talking to different stakeholders they were looking at it from different perspectives so you had to have the holistic benefit in mind and so the the benchmark wasn't bringing uh, equitable learning to people by itself it was doing so affordably and i think that is a distinction That is important to note because as we try and work with our institutions, with organizations, with vendor partners, that having that alignment around what we're going to accomplish and knowing that there are multiple points of value that need to be achieved in order for this to be a success is something that everybody has to agree to and sign on for. Um, And so with that, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about what's next on the horizon because This conversation, we would be remiss to not talk about uh, where we can take this innovation next. Now that we've cracked the code on being able to uh, drive behavior change and uh, reduce the inequity uh, that exists, Um, Scott, I wanted to ask you what other ideas you have. The other aspect of what I think we need to drive towards is actually reviewing the content with diversity in mind. Um, and actually reading the text, actually looking at the imagery, actually being sensitive. It's not really the soft side of what we do. We solve the technical part of what we do, right? But we haven't solved the soft side of what we do in terms of representation. Representation is a huge problem um, for the content. And in the way that we walked into this all text situation, right? Where we had human beings writing all text at considerable expense, big issue, and time to market, huge issue um, for everybody. Um, equity at that level is also something I think we need to solve for. I would want blue sky. 
I would want a technology driven solution towards reading the words, looking at the imagery with that in mind, which is a huge ask. Um, far more difficult than looking at a technical image, I think. Um, if there's an ask, that's it. That's my future ask. Good luck. Well, we have a lot of people uh, that are part of the online learning consortium that come from a, a you know, variety of different backgrounds, technical, academic. Uh, you know, we would like, uh, Scott and I, to hear your thoughts on uh, you know, this subject and any ideas about how we might be able to take it forward, because this is certainly you know, the next step on uh, next step in getting to a, a better tomorrow for for the learners of the world. And so, you know, in conclusion, uh, you know, it's all about uh, collaboration, uh, tech, technology tools come and go, they evolve. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that, uh, but, you know, finding ways to implement them effectively, to understand where people are in their comfort level and technological sophistication, uh, you know, those are very important aspects to making these efforts successful having a good community of partners, uh, setting expectations and, and getting aligned and being open to change uh, is something that, uh, you know, we think are, you know, some of the key tenets of uh, being able to drive, uh, you know, some of these meaningful efforts like, like the one uh, that we were talking about today. Uh, so on this slide, you'll see uh, my email address. It's my first and last name at continualengine.com. If you would like to continue the conversation, please reach out to me directly and Scott and I can be in touch to uh, brainstorm and, and uh, you know, share ideas. And, uh, you know, also uh, this next slide uh, shows the uh, session survey information. Uh, please uh, take a moment and, and evaluate our session and let us know how we did. But uh, Scott and I thank you very much for taking the time to uh, listen to our story and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody.